the cows gusty renegade in for another broadcast hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy today's date monday november 9 2020 so i have been told uh here hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy what it is how it works uh, our broadcast for today uh, we're supposed to be hanging out with our guest uh, professor uh, Paul Ortiz professor at the University of Florida uh, I've given his line a ring about three times or so and it's just going to voicemail uh, we confirmed uh, via email uh, earlier today for the time for the broadcast and everything. So uh, I am not sure uh, what's going on. I'll try and give him a few more rings to see if we can get him on the line to discuss his work. Uh, he is his, well, he's a professor, so he's written, done research on many things, most of it about uh, racism, white supremacy in the U.S., but specifically, I became uh, aware of his work in Isabel Wilkerson's uh, case, which we're reading right now, uh, second worst book ever. Uh, she cites uh, an article that he wrote. He's written books as well, but she cited an article that he wrote about white terrorism against black Florida voters and I sought the article out had pretty constructive information and we're in the middle of an election season right now thought oh how appropriate uh, that we would get him on to talk uh, about this report uh, but this report is a part of uh, his larger uh, scholarship uh, he has a whole book that's pretty much about this subject matter uh, white terrorism uh, against black voters black people in general uh, in Florida and black people's efforts to uh, resist uh, which includes armed self-defense that gets ignored a lot too so I hoping we get a chance to kind of discuss a bit of all of that as well as some of the election results what happened in the state of Florida specifically and all that good man the governor Ron DeSantis maybe even get a word in about uh, Andrew Gillum the Great uh, as I said I uh, we confirmed uh, via email and everything he should be ready to roll we had the time and everything uh, I gave him several rings uh, before I came on live and it was just going to voicemail I sent him an email uh, as well and I've not heard anything back so I'll give another second or two matter of fact we'll go ahead and, and try him again now let's see for or hopefully we will get a ring or an answer that would be even better let's see try him again now all right uh, reconnected there have been lots of tech issues uh, particularly I mean it's been for the duration of the time that we have been broadcasting but especially I would say the last two months or so um, lots of people uh, have emailed and called in and said that they have had trouble uh, dialing in I have had lots of trouble uh, dialing in uh, to participate. I had trouble dialing in today, even before we went live, and you know we're having difficulties with the guest um, not answering. Uh, I was having trouble even you know connecting. I was like, dang, I hope we don't have these you know problems when the guest is on, where we're getting disconnected and everything. Uh, but you know, to be expected. Uh, I would love to say that it's just um, me being inept. Uh, and or having poor Wi-Fi incidentally since I got you know my nice spiffy Wi-Fi when I got my computer problems corrected I thought uh, at least on the hardware end of it I never have Wi-Fi issues any sort of problems connecting being online never until it's time to broadcast let's see got an email Let's see. Okay. He says he's in a emergency uh, council meeting and to ring him in a few. So we'll hang out for a few minutes and chat it up. Incidentally, our guest for this evening's program, uh, Professor Ortiz, uh, as what happened last week, uh, we had someone who might identify as Hispanic. Again, that is not 
a racial classification. Uh, if you listen to the cows, I will frequently uh, talk about the importance of words and I recommend not using terms like Latino, uh, Hispanic. We're talking about white supremacy racism. These are not racial classifications. Uh, they'll have designations like white Hispanic and that type of thing, which just adds more confusion. You want to know, is this person classified, accepted as white? That's what we're talking about. All the other information, that's good to know, can be relevant, may even be important. But the critical piece of information, is this person classified as white? yes or no and if you are white you certainly cannot be confused about the answer to that question that's not possible white people will let you know in a variety of ways so that's number one but the rest yeah I'm also looking forward to ask if he's actually uh, red cased uh, this will be uh, I guess for anyone who is laboring through uh, this text with us second worst book ever uh, maybe we can take an uh, uh, opportunity and ask, see if he's read the book. He's a historian, so uh, I suspect we'll hopefully in a few moments have a chance to ask, but he may have spent some of the time uh, in the house this year getting some reading done, so maybe he also has flipped through case, and we can ask him about this book too. But uh, again, that's how I became aware of his work. He's referenced in Isabel Wilkerson's book, and yes, we'll wait. Uh, we'll give him, he said, three or so minutes we'll give him another couple minutes here and see if we can proceed for the evening wow mm -mm -mm. wacky week wacky month on the plantation speaking of case we'll be here on thursday 8 p.m eastern 5 p.m pacific uh for the book club uh almost done thank you lord almost done uh, and looking forward uh, to reading The People vs. O.J. Simpson, or it's The Run of His Life, The People vs. O.J. Simpson. That's the actual title of the book that all that is based on. Uh, the Run of His Life. Jeffrey Tubin. <laughs> Unless I'm misinformed that I have been checking, still employed with The New Yorker. <sighs> Coming in the book club. I'm excited. All right. Uh, we'll give a quick sound clip and then we'll try Mr. Ortiz again. Context to white supremacy. We'll be right back. late 1960s, after the death of Martin Luther King and the riots and the upheavals and all like this, and black people with their fists in there and all like that and trying to stumble and fumble and find their way and get focused, the white supremacists made a blueprint and put it in action. And that is, I'm going to have these people so confused, they don't even know what they started out to do. And by the late 1970s, they had just about completed it. And we've been on that ever since. And you mentioned something very important. They are more comfortable than ever. But see, it's like making gorillas comfortable in a cage or monkeys or pandas. You still got them in a cage, but they're comfortable. See, so give him some bling bling. It's like giving an animal a brand new car and training the animal to ride up and down the street in it. And then you stand back and point at the animal. Like one white man said in the late 1950s, he said he doesn't care what kind of car a Negro has. He said he's still a nigger. And when he rides by in a shiny car, to him, it's just a monkey in a car. White people built a car, put a monkey in it, trained the monkey to drive the car, so now you're looking at a monkey in a car. See, what black people don't see themselves that way. But this is how the white supremacists see us, and they are the ones who run our business. And we have to know that. 
that when they look at us, that's what they see. That that's what they see. That that's what they see. And at a subliminal level, what they see begins to spill over into our brains so that we, at a subliminal level, see each other that way and indirectly see ourselves that way. Wrote about, uh, he, basically, he wrote a book basically about how all of the presidents have uh, conformed to the system of white supremacy in different ways. And uh, he was talking about how some of them would just say something about racism and black people would get very happy, but then they wouldn't do anything. And he said some of the uh, presidents just commented about how confused, but how, just how confused they were. Like they just wouldn't seem to understand. These people would just come out and make a comment or two about racism and, and black people would think, oh, we got a friend, you know, this person is for us, and they would never do anything to help them. They would just, you know, keep pushing white supremacy along. And uh, I was thinking, like, we're – non-white people, we're so confused about this. Like a non-white person I spoke to today, he said the, the whole situation in Jenna, he said uh, he didn't understand how people, he said he felt like people were trying to make it more about race than it was. And I said, well, I don't think you have that situation. <laughs> you don't have a problem of racism, white supremacy. I mean, I, just, I mean, to my knowledge, that whole situation is more of the evidence that we are in a system of white supremacy. Um, I don't know, just that confusion, like people, people, non-white people not really understanding what white supremacy means, how much... That's why I put it in the front of the book. If you don't understand that, then everything else that you do understand will confuse you. And I've seen that ever since I've been talking about it and even before then. That's how that phrase came into being, that quotation. I put it in the front of the book to remind people of that. Ain't no point in going nowhere and doing nothing if you don't understand that. Because everything that you do is going to make no complete nonsense. Everything that you think that you want to do is much going to be a, turn out to be a bunch of nonsense if you don't understand that. Because, see, this is all about the connections with the meaning of existence. Everybody, you know, has a reason or think that they should have a reason for existence. If you, and if you're existing on this planet and you don't have no perceptions of understanding about white supremacy and what it works, to the extent that you lack these perceptions, your entire existence is going to be a total mess because you're not going to make sense to yourself about nothing that you do or nothing that you plan on doing. It's just that way because that's the biggest show in town. It's the only one that counts. That's just a fact of the matter, and it's a very unhappy situation. <laughs> Amen. You know. Hmm. Have white people made that their reason for being on the planet, to practice white supremacy? Yes, and, and, and see, and so you have wound up with two basically types of people on the planet, and that is the white culture, which is white supremacists, and the victim culture, which is the non-white people. And that's it. Hmm. And the victim culture is just what the victim culture is. I mean, you know, people walk around acting like victims. Hello? Professor Ortiz? Speaking. Greetings. This is Gus uh, with the cows. Uh, got your message about the emergency meeting and everything? Has it concluded? Are you able to join us or are you? Um, just zoomed off. Yeah, we're we're being... Uh, essentially threatened with reopening our entire campus, UF. We're in, uh, wh where are you calling from? Seattle, Washington. Okay, yeah. So we, <laughs> we actually grew up in Bremerton. So we have a different political reality down here. And so uh, we're a Trump state. So our unions are fighting to try to keep our faculty and students safe right now. And our administration wants us to reopen campus. So uh, to please their master Trump. So that's what we have the meeting for tonight. But, um, yeah, how can I help you? Uh, we're all set for the uh, broadcast to discuss some of your writing about, uh, well, some of what you just said, in fact, uh, election violence against okay. black people in Florida and the like. Uh, we are all set. I had a brief audio clip about that exactly, uh, 
violence against okay. black people in Florida uh, to begin with and some of the election. Cool. Uh, and once that's done, uh, we'll delve into your work. Uh, you should be able to hear the clip in about okay. five seconds. Let's see. Five seconds. Wonderful. With the end of campaign season, we're going to hear a lot of conversation about the Latino vote or the black vote. What you won't hear a lot about is the white vote. So I asked Gene Demby from NPR's Code Switch podcast team to come on the program and talk about why. Well, then let's come back to the Latino vote for a moment, right, as it's being talked about in Florida and in Arizona. Um, put that um, in the context of what you're telling us about the media and how we talk about white voters. Latino is a term that's worth sort of us taking apart and exploring in greater detail, but it is a pan-ethnic term that doesn't work in quite the same way that white does for electoral purposes. The Latinos in Maricopa County who might end up turning Arizona Democratic have different, you know, familial countries of origin than the Latinos in Miami-Dade County in Florida who shifted towards Trump in this election. The Cubans and Venezuelan in Florida are outliers among Latino voters who trend strongly Democratic overall across the country. Um, meanwhile, you know, n white non-Republicans in the electorate, they are the outliers, which is why, you know, Democrats rely so much on strong turnout from voters of color to be viable in presidential elections. But it's important that, you know, we think about the ways that there are many, many white Latinos. And because whiteness so thoroughly informs voting behavior, we should probably be asking better questions about Latino voters, like whether they identify as white or not. That might be more illuminating than simply whether someone refers to themselves as Latino in some ways. No, we've never seen democracy. All we've seen is hypocrisy. American streets will be running red tonight when people release the beast. The beast in Florida, a history of anti-black violence. Um, before I get to the overall purpose of what you were trying to do with the book, I wanted to focus on two words. The first one, beast. Uh, why did you use the term beast in the title? Because I wanted to connote to people that this, was, that this thing had a presence. This, to me, the beast was uh, the embodiment of white racial hatred and violence. That's, that's, that's what the beast was. That was what was allowed to prowl Florida virtually uh, unchallenged for, for almost a century. It was the beast. It, it prowled, it sought people out, it victimized, it hid itself, it, it, it exerted tremendous power over people who were not even a part of it. So I saw all of that as, uh, as the embodiment of, of what I conceive of beast to be. Uh, and uh, that's, that's why I use that term. Release the beast, boys! Okay, and this is in uh, the subtitle, A History of Anti-Black Violence. Uh, what do you mean when you use the term anti-black? I mean, incidents in which uh, white people set out intentionally to harm black people. Uh, and there were numerous incidents in which that happened in Florida, uh, both legalized lynching and, 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 and illegal lynching. A grotesque menace to our just society who had the audacity to fight back. Context of white supremacy. Oof. That was a brief snippet, the first portion, NPR talking about the election results. Uh, and, well, they didn't have a conclusion at the time, but some of the early results in Florida specifically. Uh, and then we heard from Dr. Marvin Dunn, uh, The Beast in Florida, History of Anti-Black Violence. That's the book that he wrote. He was been with us uh, as a guest on the program a few times now. Uh, in fact, he was with us most recently. Talk about election season. He was with us before and after the Florida gubernatorial race in 2018, where he thought Andrew Gillum was going to be successful. He was going to write a, write a book about the first black governor in Florida. I told him, no way, <laughs> no way, Ron DeSantis. But that's off topic. Well, not really, not really. I was going to say it's off topic, but it's just not the totality of what we are discussing this here evening. So today, as I said, we were re reading is more important than watching television. I say that all the time. There's no way you can listen to the cows and not get lots. And I mean, lots of material to read, to get a better understanding of racism. So just in the first five minutes of what I just said right there. So you got the beast in Florida, Dr. Martin Dunn. I found out about our guest for tonight's program from our book club reading Isabel Wilkerson, Cased, 
the origins of our discontents, she mentions violence in Florida against black people trying to vote. I went to the footnotes. If you're going to read the book, you should at least maybe glance through the references to see, you know, where they got the information from. You might find another book worth reading. Uh, in this case, I did. I found our guest for today's broadcast. Uh, in addition, I uh, heard some of it to being a professor of history at the University of Florida. Uh, he has written the 2006 publication Emancipation Betrayed, the Hidden History of Black Organizing and White Violence in Florida from Reconstruction to the Bloody Election of 1920. This book was awarded the Harry T. and Harriet V. Moore Book Prize. Pleasure to have him on the program with us, joining us live, Professor Paul Ortiz. Thank you so much for joining us. Hot from a meeting, debating, uh, sending students and faculty uh, back in person uh, to the Florida campus. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, yes, sir. Thank you for having me. It's really an honor and then to be spoken of in the same uh, breath as uh, my dear friends and colleagues, Isabel Wilkerson and Marvin Dunn. I was actually just on a panel uh, with Professor Dunn uh, just last month uh, on the topic of elections and politics and the history of anti-black uh, racial violence. So, again, it's a real honor to, to be here with you. All right on. You see him. Tell him I said hi. We should have wagered. I told him arrogantly, in fact. <laughs> I don't know about this Gillum fella. Like, I could be wrong, and I'm yeah. thousands of miles from Florida, but DeSantis did win. <laughs> anyway, right. Uh, anything you would like to share with our listeners in addition to being forced back unsafely uh, to campus and already being very aware of Dr. Marvin Dunn, Isabel Wilkerson's great work? Anything you'd like to share about the work that you do? Well, you know, my you mentioned emancipation betrayed, and, and we have been very active. Uh, I've been very active in the past um, several months because, uh, you know, as you know, part of the conclusion of the book is focusing on the 1920. Uh, political uh, uh, general election in Florida, which is one of the bloodiest elections in American history. And it was a campaign where literally hundreds, hundreds of thousands of African Americans in Florida uh, got active. And your listeners will, will actually recognize uh, some of the names. These include people like Mary McLeod Bethune, James Walden Johnson, Walter White. Uh, Florida was really ground zero of the black freedom struggle uh, in that months leading up to 1920. And white supremacy, white business supremacy, I, I identify this uh, in the book, struck back uh, lethally. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan was reorganized. Uh, the state uh, law enforcement got in the business of voter suppression uh, and the epicenter of the violence. Now, there, there was anti-black violence all over Florida. And as you've heard from Dr. Dunn, uh, he uses the metaphor of the beast. Well, what happened in 1920, that general election, was that uh, scores of African Americans were assassinated by white terrorists. The epicenter of the violence uh, hit western Orange County, Florida, uh, especially a town called Ocoee, where hundreds of African Americans tried to vote uh, on Election Day, November 2nd uh, in 1920. Uh, white terrorists drove into their town, and these, this is not a mob. This was well organized violence. Many of these were white military veterans. Uh, white police officers, uh, white businessmen, uh, and for two days laid siege to this black community, killed scores of people, uh, burned people out of their homes, drove people out, and robbed uh, scores of African Americans of their homes, of their farms. And we were commemorating the 100th anniversary of that terrible massacre uh, this week. And actually, this weekend, I was actually, um, I zoomed in virtually to participate uh, in the 100th uh, commemoration uh, or, you know, commemoration of the 100th um, anniversary of that grim um, event. And uh, the good news I can share with you is that the state of Florida has finally made it a requirement that every student in the state will study what happened during the Ocoee Election Day massacre. Uh, and, you know, it's been a long struggle. We're, we're still trying to get things like reparations for the descendants um, of the victims, because uh, again, this is like Tulsa, 1921. This is like Elaine, Arkansas, 1919. Uh, this is like East St. Louis in 1917. It isn't a mob that attacks black people. It's a well-organized group of individuals, and they go in and they steal black property and they they expropriate. Uh, so that's what I've been up to this week. In addition to a lot of other things, um, 
uh, I heard uh, one of the commentators talking about the Latino vote. And so one of my more recent books uh, is called An African-American and Latinx History of the United States. And I break that down quite a bit, too. It's interesting to be in Florida. <laughs> what a place to live in right now. Tell me about it. You can say that almost anywhere in the world right now with the year that we have had. Like, wow. Just hoping to get to the end of it. Um, wow. So that great uh, kind of introduction. And hopefully we can ask some questions and dig, uh, get some details as we proceed. Uh, and you touched on a little bit of it and just given over some of your background, which you're researching uh, for you specifically, uh, Dr. Ortiz. Uh, your racial classification, like what's on your driver's license, if you filled out the census, what box do you check specifically? Yeah. Are you classified as a white person? No, I classify as Chicano, Mexican-American. I was born in 1964, and so I'm just old enough to have remembered um, elders around me, uh, you know, <laughs> referring to the term Chicano in very negative ways sometimes. Mm -hmm. Chicano is a movement-oriented term. It's a movement identity. So I came a political age. I'm, a, I'm basically a third-generation military veteran. Uh, all of the, the people in my family, all of the men growing up, were in the military going back, you know, even before the Mexican Revolution. My, all my grandparents, male and female, fought in the Revolution. That's how we ended up in the United States in 1914. We came here the same, or my grandparents' generation, fled the nation the same week that the U.S. Marines invaded Tampico and occupied the oil fields upstream from the port of Veracruz. And so I grew up in that kind of environment. Um, you didn't call any – look, I have family members who voted for Trump. Uh, if you called any of them white, those are fighting words. You wouldn't dare do that. They would, they would, have, they, they would have major issues with, it, uh, with you. So, yeah, race among Mexican-Americans, Latinos, uh, Chicanos, Puerto Ricans, Cub Cubanos, it, it's a very complex thing. And, but our, the, the phenotype for, uh, for our peoples, for Latinx peoples writ large, phenotype doesn't necessarily drive your political orientation. It does sometimes, but um, you'll find people lighter skinned than I am. Uh, who are, you know, who are anarchists, you know, who are very left. Um, and, you know, Florida is an outlier, I think, uh, I hope, um, because, you know, this past month during Hispanic Heritage Month, or what we used to call Hispanic Heritage Month, um, I did scores of events. And, and I did events in Chicago, Seattle, Los Angeles, uh, New York, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Miami, and more and more, uh, you're seeing uh, uh, people begin to break out of preconceived notions of what it means to be Cuban, Dominican, Puerto Rican, Mexican. Uh, so it, it's a really dynamic history, just as dynamic in many ways as African-American African uh, uh, history. Uh, but, you know, Florida is definitely uh, a, a place to, to be. It's... it's um, it's not a state that's trending in a progressive direction. We have some successful, you know, local area struggles. Um, you have to remember, though, I mean, here, here's the thing I am proud of. We did pass the, um, the $15 minimum wage um, referendum and passed by 60%. Um, and, you know, good old California actually voted down affirmative action again, just like they did when I lived there in the 70s as a kid. So there, you know, there's some seemingly contradictory political things happening in places like Florida and California. Hmm. The racial classification component uh, generates a lot of confusion. Uh, and in my view, that benefits uh, racist white supremacists. I said before you got here, we said repeatedly, uh, I recommend not using these terms. Number one, if we're talking about racism, white supremacy, uh, Hispanic, Latino, these are not racial classifications. Uh, I think even in the segment from NPR, they said white Latino, white Hispanic. That right there, again, signifies these are not racial classifications. You can have a non-white person who is Hispanic, a white person who is Hispanic, and on down the line. Uh, very important in terms of racial classifications. Are you classified, accepted, able to function as a white person? So just making sure, is there any point where you have been able to be accepted, to classify yourself, to be accepted as white? 
Well, if you read uh, my book, African American Latinx History of the United States, um, I have an author's note there. And, you know, I grew up in the 70s, and basically uh, we were all wetbacks uh, and, and worse. And so, no, I've never identified as white. And even when I was in the military, see, this is how I ended up in Central America. I often tell people this is, this is my first uh, experience with affirmative action. They took all the Hispanics, <laughs> you know, they call us Hispanics, right? They took all the Hispanics and sent us to Central America uh, to fight in those civil wars. Uh, so, but, but, you know, here's the interesting thing about those, those classifications. I, I mentioned earlier, I'm usually an outsider, well, 99.9% .9 of the time, when I'm asked to come in and give a lecture, um, and, and the, the events I mentioned during his, what we used to call Hispanic Heritage Month, depending on the community that I'm asked to come in and speak with, that community has the right to, to, to define their own identification. So sometimes it's Chicano, sometimes it is a Latino, sometimes it's Latinx, sometimes it is you know, Afro-Latino. Right, and so um, I talk about the terms, and and but again, as an outsider to most of the communities that I that I speak to, uh, when I'm giving these talks about, you know, the history of Mexico, the history of the Latin American Wars of Independence, the history of the Haitian Revolution, um, and right there, a lot of my Haitian American uh, students are saying, "Hey, you know, we are Latinos," and but you have to remember, I'm in Florida. Florida has very different politics than New York or California. And the interesting thing is that, you know, there's an increasing divergence, I think, between what I hear from people and say, like, so for example, Wednesday, um, I'm doing a program in the South Bronx. Uh, there's a very vibrant Dominican uh, community there. And, uh, you know, <laughs> again, you don't use certain terms with them. And, and uh, as an outsider, I will use the, the terms of designation that you tell me you're comfortable with with me using it's just kind of like the pronouns right if you say i want to use you know him uh, uh he uh, or you want to you want me to use they or she or whatever you know i'm going to do it um and so again i don't necessarily think that the racial classification based upon my my historical research it uh, again it doesn't always dovetail perfectly with, with politics i mean it does sometimes but um you know there, there's definitely def where I learned this, by the way, is as a movement organizer. So uh, I was a younger labor organizer with the United Farm Workers Union. And what I learned uh, there I is Pause that, right there, because we have a lot of content that I want to cover, and the racial classification, oh, yeah, yeah. I don't want to yeah. diverge too far from there. I do just want to ask briefly, okay. if I can get a succinct answer here, uh, for any I am classified as black, is it logical for a victim of white supremacy, especially a black person who absolutely no way I could be accepted as white to ask and to make sure yeah. that you have clarity about racial classification when you're speaking to someone. Is that logical? Oh, now uh, say it again. You were broken up a little bit. I said, is it logical me as a black person or really any black person who is asking to get clarification about who they are talking to with regards to racial classification just to find out Am I talking to someone who is white or not? Is that a logical thing to do? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's perfectly fine. I think that if you, again, I'm thinking of where my, and I, I just, I'll give you kind of a personal anecdote. If you go to where most of my father's family grew up in, you know, fourth, fifth ward, Houston, Texas, you know, Vance Street, in that area. If you ask that question, you know, you're going to get certain answers. Um, if you go to, uh, you know, say Miami Dade County in Florida, you're going to get certain answers, um, you know, different answers than you will in, you know, in, in Harris County, um, Texas. But you know, I, I think it's a fine question to to ask. Awesome. Much obliged for your answer, sir. Uh, this program, context of whites, and I linked I linked uh, Dr. Ortiz his website. Uh, he has photographs where he's been out, done lectures and talked about his research and everything. So listeners can go check out a picture, what have you, and, you know, see for yourself, come to your own conclusion. Um, this program, Context of White Supremacy, I use the term racism 
and the term white supremacy. I use them as synonyms. Uh, I use the same definition for both terms. That definition is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Do you think such a system exists? Do you think that definition is accurate? Yes, and the only thing I would add to that is in Emancipation Betrayed, I talk about white business supremacy. And the reason I do that is I think it's really important to understand who is animating the system, who keeps it moving, who keeps it going. And so during this, this time period that I've been working on recently, the era of, of these anti-black programs in Elaine and Ocoee and Rosewood, the people driving these events, the white people, are very powerful people. They're elected officials, they're police officers, they're politicians, they're plantation owners, uh, they own factories. And this, this is something the business class in this U.S. often gets out of, out of admitting. Like, for example, when I tell my students that Henry Ford uh, received the highest honor uh, from Adolf Hitler in the Nazi, uh, Nazi Germany, they're stunned. They're like, well, but, you know, we thought of business, and we're, we're progressive. I'm like, no. Um, you know, most members of the Klan during its most violent era uh, were, in fact, highly educated. Uh, they were, again, elected officials. They were... Uh, heads of chambers of commerce, and certainly that was the case in Florida, and that's why uh, anti-black violence has been so lethal, because it's driven by people who have the levers of power of the state, right? It's not driven by people who live in trailer parks. It's people who uh, control city hall and are very powerful people. So I, I agree with your definition. I guess what I've learned about white supremacy is from people like say, Cedric Robinson, uh, who founded Black Studies at UC Santa Barbara and wrote Black Marxism, or W.E.B. Du Bois, to, uh, to also think about the economic interests behind white, uh, global white supremacy. But I think you're exactly right. You have to think about this as a global system. And that's where we think of, of you know, the great African-American scholars like, say, Oliver Cromwell Cox, uh, C.L.R. James, Dr. Du Bois, they all saw white supremacy as a global system of domination, imperialism, colonialism, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Just uh, pointing out for our listeners, uh, I do not uh, disaggregate because we've talked to some white people and some non-white people where sometimes uh, they'll shift blame to poor white people and say that they're the ones who are responsible for keeping racism going uh, and then other times they'll switch back and say that it's powerful rich white people who are responsible and they just trick poor white people into going along in my view at least logic dictates it would have to be that all white people and I've seen no evidence to the contrary all of the individuals classified as white regardless of how much is in their bank account seem to be on board dedicated to white supremacy racism as a global system the evidence would seem to suggest that overwhelmingly uh, the before I get specifically to how I came to know about your work referenced in uh, Isabel Wilkerson's case uh, with the election you're in Florida as you said what a time to be in Florida uh, what are your thoughts I guess if you want to give anything general with you know uh, president-elect Biden's victory uh, and or what specifically happened in your state. I think Trump took Florida again, not that I was surprised about that, uh, and specifically the folks who were responsible for at least him taking Florida. President Trump, any thoughts on the election? Yeah, I mean, we have, um, well, I mean, we, we always try to be positive to a certain extent. We have a lot of really good community organizers in Florida, and you know, I, I don't want to, you know, be all negative. Uh, certainly, you know, it's, it's, it's a loss on the one level. But we have a lot of really good organizations. We have the, the Dream Defenders, which formed uh, in the wake of the murder of Trayvon Martin. They've done really good grass, uh, grassroots work. Uh, your listeners may have heard about uh, Amendment 4 a few years ago. We were able to, to get over a million petitions signed uh, to restore the, the rights of convicted felons, to restore their voting rights. 
we did get that passed. Uh, it passed by like 63 or 64 percent of the ballot of the vote uh, two elections ago. Actually, during governors, you mentioned DeSantis and, and Gillum. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, once DeSantis got, got in office, he and the state legislature and the courts have stopped that. Um, and so that's actually, you know, voter suppression Voter suppression is, is a universal phenomenon in American political life. Uh, it's just it's more, uh, even a greater force in states like Georgia and, and Florida. Uh, and so that's a constant struggle in this state against voter suppression. And that's why groups like the Dream Defenders, you know, put so much energy into trying to get out, uh, get out the vote. And so we just had very mixed results here in, in the Deep South, I'll say. I mean, we we're very inspired by what happened in Georgia. Um, but all throughout Florida, if, if, if all you have to do is kind of um, check out some of our, our reactionary politicians, and uh, the state has been electing some very right-wing people, Matt Gates up in uh, West Florida, uh, very reactionary. In, in my home district, uh, Congressman Ted Yoho, uh, you can just check him out, and, and you realize that, wow, these are really reactionary uh, people, I mean, but you know, when I look back to emancipation to trade and the research I did on that, the Florida has attracted these types of, of, of white people for, for generations, and they're just kind of an exaggeration of the typical white American. They're just a little more reactionary, perhaps, than, than, than others might be. Hmm. Did you uh, see this is next door? I don't know, maybe they did have it in Georgia. They had the uh, shake your booty to the polls uh, advertisements. They said specifically they were trying to target black male voters to make sure that they got out and supported in the U.S. presidential election. Did you see that? Or maybe they had those in Florida, too, perhaps. We had the souls to the polls. I didn't I didn't hear about this. You said shake your booty to the polls. Yes, it featured uh, strippers. Okay. This was uh, for Atlanta and Atlanta's popular with strip clubs and all of that. But it it got lots of attention. A lot of it <laughs> negative, I'll say. Um, just okay. questioning why, because I mean, I don't do they have advertisements for election to encourage people to vote featuring strippers in, in the Sunshine State? Did that happen? I, I didn't see any of those. Um, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but yeah, I, I just didn't see any of those. Okay. We didn't have those here in Washington state. If they did have them, I missed those, but I don't think they had them here okay. either. And I've never seen them in my life before where strippers <laughs> are invoked to encourage you to shake your booty to the pole. But Hey, I guess Georgia went for Biden. So I guess maybe it did have some impact um, to the report. Now this is, as I said, Isabel Wilkerson, she referenced uh, Okoye, I think that's how you say it, Okoye, Florida, remembering the single bloodiest day in modern U.S. political history. Uh, this is referenced in Case, I guess, before I get specific to the report. Have you read Case? Did you know she cites your work in her book? Oh, yes. Um, you know, we've done panels together. We're actually doing one at the Zora Neale Hurston Festival, I believe, in January or February. And so... Um, you know, I I am a big fan of her work, um, and one of the things you know I, I try to learn from her in terms of being a writer who writes for a general audience, who is rigorous but at the same time is readable. And as you probably know, that's not necessarily a talent that all academics are taught. And so, um, yeah, she that book has made a big impact in in Florida. A lot of my students are reading the book. What um, what are the demographics of your students, and in terms of a big impact, can you give more detail in terms of is it are they saying hey this is a different way uh, in terms of thinking about this problem? Are they saying I think case is a more accurate way of describing the problem? Like just give us more details about the impact it's having and the demographics of your students. Well, I think they're kind of experimenting with it. I mean, I have so I'm a faculty advisor for a lot of black and brown student organizations at the University of Florida, including the Dream Defenders, um, Port Columbia, um, uh, uh, Chiefs Bus, which is primarily uh, identifying, you know, students who, who choose Latinx as their term of identifier. Um, they tend to be the activist students. And, you know, they're trying out different theories of racism and trying to understand 
the deep embeddedness of racism, uh, systemic racism in American society. And I think this is one of the reasons why CASE has made such a big impact among them. In fact, a group of students approached me recently and have said, hey, Professor Ortiz, you know, can you <laughs> try, can we try to get, um, you know, uh, Isabel Wilkerson down here for an event, you know, at least a Zoom event. So um, I think they're grappling with the same problems that we all are all across the country, which is that, you know, systemic racism isn't going anywhere. I mean, it do, you know, it doesn't matter that Joe Biden is elected. We still have to deal with the with uh, mass incarceration and the brutality of law enforcement, uh, massive voter suppression, massive inequalities, uh, the fact we haven't been able to get reparations. Um, and so I think that her book in some ways uh, provides another kind of explanatory framework to to try to grapple with with the, this seemingly unmovable object that um, you know we get Marvin Dunn called the beast, right? Do you think uh, case because you use the term white supremacy uh, liberally uh, in your research and writing? Uh, do you think caste is a more accurate term uh, to describe this global system of white supremacy? You know, I don't, I don't think so. And the reason is, I mean, I, I like her work in the sense that, you know, again, it's really, you know, you have to, I, I think that scholars and anyone studying racism has to come to grips with again, the fact that it's not going anywhere. You know, there's no sense that systemic racism is somehow lifted magically or, you know, somehow white supremacy is, is and, and I have colleagues who are like, well, you know, white supremacy is the force it used to be. Well, I don't know, because I do a lot of field work in rural parts of the South. You know, I've traveled in different parts of the world. And I've seen it operate all over the world. And my my hesitation with the term is it goes back to what Oliver Cromwell Cox uh, Cox said in his book Case Class uh, Case Class and Race, and we have to remember that that you know Professor Cox was part of that incredible triumvirate talking about C.L.R. James, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Oliver Cox, who again looked internationally at race, what Cedric Robinson later called racial capitalism. Uh, so Oliver Cox's argument in caste, class, and race was ca case is too static of a term of a concept to describe this kind of muscular white supremacy in the United States, um, and that you can't really – it's like comparing apples and oranges. Um, yeah, case is important, but can you really use the term to describe what's happening in the United States? I mean, most scholars um, during that period, uh, of the 1940s um, kind of rejected the term. It was, it's been tried out at different points. Um, so, yeah, I, I just, again, I think there's a lot of, of really important things that, that Isabel Wergerson has to say. Um, but I, I think that the concept of case, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it replaces white supremacy. Much obliged. I definitely appreciate because we have been talking about that because we uh, they're making a documentary of this book. Did you know that Ava DuVernay? She made uh, Selma and 13th. Uh, she and Oprah Winfrey and I'm sure many other folks, but they're producing a documentary uh, of Cased. I think I think it's for Netflix or streaming uh, type service. But we were talking about that, like this book has got such a big push and it's a bestseller. And now it's yeah. going to be a documentary that. I just I think it's going to be more and more folks like your students who are, wow, my, this may be a, a great new theory that we can use to try to make sense of what's happening and all of that. We just, and in fact, we just read that section on Mr. Cox and his book on case. We just read that section, I think, uh, this past Friday uh, in the book. All of that to say, I think we're about. 75 percent of the way done. Uh, we have a few chapters okay. left, but we're more than. More than all the way there. Um, I just have wow, you, so you've read through the whole. You've had you've read through the whole unabridged version. Yes, sir. We started. Uh, wow, very September. cool. We've we've been reading for I think two months now. It's not like we just started a week ago. We've okay. been on. We we started almost right when I think it was published in July, and we started maybe okay. a few weeks after that. So we read her first. So so. Wow, very cool. 
Well, I was going to say the reason I asked is, you know, there is an abridged version. I'm talking about cast, you know, uh, I'm talking about cast, class, and race. Now you're talking about Isabel Wilkerson's book, though, right? Yes, yes, sir. Oh, excellent, excellent. See, I thought you were talking for a minute about Oliver Cox's book, uh, Cast, Class, and Race. And the reason I asked the question, the unabridged version, was that the original version was like 600. And fifty pages, I think. Oh, um, okay. Not that I'm opposed yeah. to reading uh, Mr. Cox's book, because we totally <laughs> uh, can check that out too. I just found his work out in Isabel Wilkerson's book, but we had read nice. The Warmth of Other Suns uh, way back years ago, uh, and I adore Excellent. that Excellent. book. That's in my top ten. I recommend yeah. that book all the time. It's got so much great information. This book, I cannot say that. Uh, in fact, I have said, and it's just got worse as we've gone along. This is the second worst book I have ever read. Uh, This is from someone we've had a book club for almost a decade. And I take it seriously because I said, I think this is going to happen. It's got a documentary film coming. And the first question I said was, this isn't Isabel Wilkerson's best book. The Warmth of Other Suns easily could be a documentary you got the yeah. narratives laid out the information like wow you talk about something cap you yeah, could do dramatizations of some of the scenes like why not make that a movie she spent 15 years writing that book she didn't spend 15 years writing case i don't know how long she spent on it it's many things i could pick out that are incorrect about the book where i just it's not as well written it's not precise she seems to have an agenda the word case is in. I'm saying it that way deliberately, but that's uh, the word taste right, right. is in that book more than a thousand times. It broke the counter. I have the electronic version. It broke the counter. Yeah. It couldn't even wow. give me an accurate count. It just stopped and said, white wow. flag, I don't know, but it's in here more than a thousand times. That's never happened yeah. with a book, and that's not including the title. It to have it as I said, to have that as an objective as don't call it racism and seen she didn't even have reasoning logic as to why we shouldn't use racism we should use case other than it offends white people which i've heard before but i mean that's yeah. not a valid they should racists should be offended that we're calling out what they're doing as incorrect and trying to stop them that's not exactly. a valid reason not to say it but even beyond if i could it's i had a long list we almost read the whole book but just the, the acknowledgments she married a white man, Brett Hamilton, as did CLR James. Okay. She writes, finally, I'm grateful beyond language. Whew. I'm grateful beyond language for the love and devotion of Brett Hamilton, the kindest and most giving husband I could have wished for, a gift from the universe. Many of the observations in this book first found a voice in our deeply fulfilling conversations in our life together. While it breaks my heart that neither he nor my parents lived to see this culmination of what we, each in our own ways, sought to transcend, I feel his cosmic embrace as I send this out to the world, and I know that all three of them are with me now and always. She says that a few times uh, about Brett Hamilton transcending Hamilton. race. And I said, now, see, that's at minimum. It's not precise. If you, maybe you can help me. You read it too. Yeah. What does that mean <laughs> that a white well, man transcends yeah, no, race? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, number one, you can't do it. I mean, it's kind of like when people say they're colorblind. And what I, what I tell my students and, and organizers is, first thing is never use that terminology that you're transcending or that you're colorblind. Uh, I joke with people, you know, I, I'm actually physically colorblind. I can't see color. It's a medical condition. And I tell people, don't ever make the mistake of walking into a room and telling people you either are colorblind or you transcend something. Uh, it's just not possible. Now, I hadn't read the acknowledgments. I've only selectively read through case on only, you know, electronically. But, um, it's interesting. I, I take your word for it because I see the, the term come up a lot, case. And again, I would I would just urge people to go back to the, the you know some of the classics, you know, black Marxism, uh, black reconstruction. Uh, I'm very old school about this. Um, I I understand there's been newer works that talk about racism, the white supremacy, but I think that the the works that came out of the anti-colonial movement, uh, Walter Rodney how Europe underdeveloped Africa, 
uh, Sealer James's Black Jacobins, Du Bois's Black Reconstruction. Um, those are works that I continue to hold close to my heart because they're written by people who are involved in political struggles. You know, uh, you talk about James. James was involved in trying to lead a global movement against the Italian invasion of Abyssinia. And that's where the, their analyses came from. You know, Du Bois writing in the heart of the Great Depression um, and uh, giving us an explanation for why white people were engaging in pogroms against African-American farmers in the Arkansas Delta and in Longview, Texas and, you know, in Rosewood, Florida. So the newer stuff, what I tell my students, you know, the newer stuff isn't necessarily better. And, and I think that that's a problem we have in this society is people say, oh, you know, it just came out. It's more advanced. You know, uh, we know things now we didn't know 50 or 80 years ago. Well, I, I, I don't always buy that. Newer, not always better. Context of white supremacy. Uh, our guest, Dr. Paul Ortiz, historian, the University of Florida. And she says it twice. It's not just in there once. She also, to the memory of my parents who survived the case system and to the memory of Brett, white husband, who defied it. Now, again, like <laughs> you're going to have to give me a list of what he did exactly other than black, uh, marrying a black female. And that doesn't count. Like unless... You know, tell me something. Was he smuggling? I wouldn't even know what the list would be. Like You'd have to tell me something really extraordinary uh, for a white man to, quote unquote, defy and or transcend racism. Second, it's lots more, but we didn't come to talk about case. Uh, You write specifically uh, in your report, uh, Okoye, Florida, remembering the single bloodiest day in modern U.S. political history, the EEOC recently settled a discrimination lawsuit with Big Lots Incorporated that involved a pattern of racial harassment in its distribution center at Rancho Cucamonga, California. Specifically, the EEOC alleged that an immediate supervisor and co-workers, all Hispanic, made racially derogatory jokes, comments, slurs and epithets including the use of the words nigger and monkey despite learning of the harassment the company took no steps to prevent or correct it Americans are accused of being ignorant in quotes of history so who taught these workers to use racial epithets that are rooted in the era of slavery and segregation great question i thought who indeed if you have other comments on this segment okay well yeah i mean basically when we use the term hispanic and we think about i mean i don't know where these uh, so-called hispanics are from Uh, like i said we didn't use that was a term that was considered derogatory when i was growing up although my father did share hispanic eoc at the puget sand naval shipyard for a little while, but I, you know, in brief, um, w- you know, we're people, you know, it, it could be Mexican, you know, Mexicans, it could be Puerto Ricans, it could be Cubans. Um, we are essentially descendants of people who grew up in the Spanish empire. And the Spanish empire was just as racist and just as white supremacist um, as any of the other empires, the French, the British, the Dutch, so on and so forth. And so, you know, this, uh, this you know, strain of white supremacy is in all of our histories, whether we're from the British, the French, or the Spanish uh, empires. Um, and the only way you unlearn that is through engaging in revolutionary self-activity. Uh, and uh, that's, so without, I, I don't, again, I don't know much about this particular case, but, you know, Mexico is, a, is an example of where, um, you know, for centuries, you know, for more centuries than, Me- than Mexico has been a, a free country, it was a colonial, uh, uh, it, was, it was occupied by the Spanish Empire. When the Spanish came to the Americas, they brought with them a brutal system of racism and anti-Semitism. And essentially, um, that's what people grew up under, you know, and lived under that situation for centuries. And I think at a, we ignore that at our peril. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something we have to constantly fight. Um, then was this in Los Angeles you said, or, well, it's, I'm reading from your report. It says Rancho Cucamonga, California. So that's Southern California. 
Oh, okay, you're reading from my work. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, hmm, I don't... This is the that, article. Oh, okay, I write a... It's from 2010, May 14th, so I mean, you know, 10 years ago. You don't have oh, to okay. Uh, no, no, yeah. you, you, uh, you caught me in a senior moment. <laughs> because, <laughs> right on, right on. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and it's from an EEOC report, right? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, okay. No, no, no. I, I yeah, I just, forgive me, I, for a minute there, I just kind of I drew a blank. But, yeah, I don't know, um, you know, the, this, you know where those workers were from, but it, what I'm trying to highlight in the report is how pervasive racism is in American workplaces, right? And this is an area that I feel very strongly about because people talk about racism in different parts of the society, but they often forget the workplace. You know, and that's, you know, that's where the EOC, I mean, I actually learned that part from, from my father who chaired Hispanic EOC, uh, at PSNS. And he would come home with, you know, stories that I thought, I was like, damn, I mean, that, uh, it's pretty cold blooded, you know, Uh-oh. people trying to us, sabotage. Maybe give, us, give us one, please. Can, can you remember one that your dad told you? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, white workers trying to sabotage, uh, you know, uh, machinery so that it, uh, uh, black and brown workers who are trying to move up and, and learn semi-skilled or skilled occupations, you know, go, go, go to work in a piece of machinery, and it's been sabotaged, and it could lead to loss of life or limb. And, and I thought, man, that is cold-blooded, you know. And, and as a kid, you know, your parents say a lot of things. And then later, I've done oral history interviews, you know, with, with African-American and Mexican-American workers, and they're like, oh, yeah, we had to deal with that all the time. Um, you know, and, and I'm teaching labor history, a, a labor history course right now, for example, and we're reading about African-American workers in the 1930s in Memphis who were trying to move up into higher paid occupational categories in international harvester. And sure enough, you know, white coworkers would actually sabotage, you know, stamping pressing machines. Uh, and if, if you if you understand what that means, is it's essentially you know throwing out gears or making it to where a person could lo- literally lose their lives. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> that's how serious white su- white supremacy is in the workplace. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we grew up with those stories. I mean, we were told when I was growing up, uh, and I, I spent a few years in the, in the I talk about this in in. Um, African American Latinx history of the United States, but you know, in the East Bay, um, it was real. I mean, we would walk down the streets, you know, the the as we, you know, the, the black and Mexican kids on our way to school in fourth grade, and I, we would walk down Marina Boulevard to James Garfield Elementary, and white adults would stop in the in their cars and throw beer cans at us and say, you know, uh, go home, go uh, go back to where you belong. And as kids, you know, as fourth graders, you're like, well, I can't go home. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to go to school. You know, I'll get into trouble. And it wasn't until a few years later we, you know, I realized, oh, they're talking about, you know, you need to go back to Mexico or you need to go back to Africa. And I thought as a kid, I thought, man, white people are just really uh, just all angry. I mean, what is the deal, man? You know, and so, yeah, that was the environment that we grew up in. We call it now the backlash era of the 1970s um, where, you know, white people have been taught that any gains in citizenship uh, by anyone who was not white somehow took something away from them. And, you know, the Republican party turned that into a religion and you know, it was Reaganism and now it's Trumpism, you know, and, and it's, it's palpable. I was cracking up laughing, not that none of that is funny. Racism, white supremacy is not funny, but we do have neutralizing workplace racism every Friday. Uh, man, we take workplace racism very seriously. That comes up Excellent. on a regular basis. Sabotage, direct, naked sabotage like just I we sometimes it's a collaborative effort we white people are going to do everything we can to see you fail now I will say I don't I can't immediately recall someone uh, talking about sabotage where it could have resulted in death but I mean 
Sabotage nonetheless. Every Friday, neutralizing workplace racism. Talk to your children about racism. You say that all the time, like just talking about things that happen on your job alone, like whoa, my workplace yeah. racism every Friday. I chuckled because Very when important. you said say it three, four times. Uh I chuckled repeatedly, but I chuckled specifically when you, you got to the backlash portion that you all grew up grew up in and remembering having white people come and throw uh, beer bottles and all the rest and blah, 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 and terrorize you when you were children. And you said that was the backlash era from the so-called civil rights movements and what have you. And I said, dang, Isabel Wilkerson, in case she has a whole part of the book titled Backlash, it is talking about backlash to President Obama. And I just said, well, how are we always in backlash? Like, that's not possible. We're just system of white supremacy racism. That's what it is. Like, uh, yeah. The uh, yeah. You specifically, uh, you do additional research because I look. I saw the article first, right? Because that's what she referenced uh, about the election violence, and I said, "Oh, wow, he's got a lot more information uh, in your book." And I stopped. Uh, I looked at the title, and I think this is an important one because. Uh, oh, oh, wait a minute! Wait a minute! I can't forget! I can't forget the other portion of your quote from the text. We got to go back to that article from 2010. You say Americans are accused okay. of being ignorant in quotes of history. You put that in quotes, and I thought that was important because I insist white people cannot be ignorant about racism. You can't be ignorant. Those white people that were coming and throwing beer bottles at you all, you can't be ignorant about racism. If you're going to sabotage the niggers that you work with and other non-white people that you work with, if you're sabotaging their machine, you can't be ignorant about racism. Even if these are some so-called non-white people who hopped the border and now they're working here and now you taught them these are niggers and monkeys. That's not ignorance about racism that's something i insist on a pretty regular basis just can you talk because you have mm -hmm. ignorance in quotes in this sentence specifically americans are accused of being ignorant of history well they they know what they're doing i think that that's what you're pointing out to us you know it's it's not i mean often the premise is well we just need to educate people and they'll change their behavior but if they don't want to change their behavior, all the education in the world is not going to change it. And, you know, so in the case of, of racism, um, you know, the people who have kept, and, and I do agree, uh, that white working class, white uh, people in poverty have kept, helped kept the system alive. And they have engaged in some of the most brutal actions. And, you know, for example, in Emancipation Betrayed, um, I talk about the Ku Klux Klan in the 1870s during Reconstruction. And when African Americans were interviewed about Klan activity, they would often, um, you know, kind of make light of the people asking them questions. Now, the people asking them questions during congressional testimony during the Ku Klux Klan hearings in 1871 assumed that black people didn't know who was in the Klan because Klansmen were rogue, right? They were, they were, um, they tried to disguise themselves. But African American, you know, uh, test, uh, testimonials essentially said, look, we know who's in the Klan. And, and they would actually, black people in Florida, Mississippi, and Alabama would actually call out Klansmen in full regalia. And they would say, you know, so and so, you think that you're, you're, you're disguised. We know who you are. Number one, we know you can't afford the horse you're riding on. You can't afford that Winchester rifle you have. You're being paid for. The plantation owner is paying you to do this to us. And this is something that, um, again, is very common in Ku Klux Klan testimony, where African-American witnesses are saying, you know, that you know, the, these poor white people coming out, you know, they, they, they can't afford that Palomino. I mean, who, who are they trying to kid? but they're benefiting from white supremacy. Um, and just like the Ekoi massacre, which you, which you mentioned earlier, um, I've had so many people tell me, oh, Paul, that was a mob, what a terrible activity. Uh, white people just lost their minds. No, it was very instrumental. And what I mean by this is that when white people drove African-Americans out of Western Orange County, Florida, they took over their land. Um, they either paid pennies for it or they paid nothing. And suddenly, white people who already own property own a lot more. 
And one of the things that came out in the ACOE commemorations this week in Florida was a number of the descendants saying, you know, look, my family owned their own farm in 1920 in western Orange County, Florida. We were driven out by white people who took over our land. And so now you want to cast dispersions when we use terms like reparations? I mean, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, uh, unless you talk about reparations right now, I just, I just don't think you can have a serious conversation about the legacies of white supremacy because uh, we're living, living those legacies now in, in Florida and other, other parts of, of, the, of the country. Legacies and ongoing dedication to white supremacy racism. Uh, just to add in, the black people might know some of the white people who are Klan members, racists, but they don't know as much information as the white people. Uh, I have not heard as many reports, well, I'll put it this way. I found it much more startling, the reports, when I've heard white people who said, oh, wow, we found out that the black people have been paying like five times, six times higher taxes, property taxes than white people for the last 75 years. We didn't even find out. In fact, Andrew Carl was saying, this was one of the ways that white people would steal black property. They refine. They don't do the Okoye method, the black Wall Street method as much. They just do, oh, you didn't pay your taxes and take it that way. But one of the methods is because it can be difficult to find out that there are racist tax methods going on. In fact, we had even a more recent report about uh, black burial grounds in Virginia where the black people did not know this area used to be a black cemetery where they're now putting a parking lot or something down. But the white people had known yeah. this for the last 150 years they knew this. There's one group that yeah. is not ignorant about racism. Uh, specifically, your book, uh, The Emancipation Betrayed, it received the Harry T. Moore and Harriet V. Moore book prize. I always think it's important to kind of make sure we get a, a shout out or a mention because a lot of folks don't know who they were and I mean you want to talk about white terrorism in Florida Boop, there you go can we just get a, a quick reminder of their efforts exactly Harry T. Moore and Harry B. Moore I'm so glad you asked were, were courageous uh, civil rights activists um, African American organizers uh, Harry T. Moore was also the statewide president of the NAACP uh, and the head of an organization called the Progressive Voters Alliance. And he led uh, a successful voter registration movement shortly after World War II and organized over 100,000 African Americans. I mean, he wasn't the only person working on the campaign, but he was the lead organizer and was able to organize over 100,000 African Americans to register to vote and really threatened to change the balance of power in Florida and he was assassinated. Uh, uh, he and his wife, uh, Harry V. Moore, were assassinated uh, Christmas Eve, 1951. The police were involved in a major cover-up. Uh, federal law enforcement was involved in a major cover-up um, of, of the perpetrators of this crime. Uh, and this is the same case in Ocoee, by the way. Um, and it's the same case in Rosewood. It's the same case in Tulsa, that because law enforcement was involved in, in these crimes, um, they were able to cover up the evidence trail. And so that's why there's so many uh, so-called cold cases decades later trying to figure out what happened. But, but Harry T. and Harry B. Moore were, were just incredible heroic people. Uh, and um, so, I mean, winning that award was really a, a tremendous honor. For sure, for sure. Lots of, <clears throat> I'll put it that way, uh, if we're going to make a documentary film, wow, let's have a documentary on the Moors. Like, that would be spectacular. Like, put that in front of many other works. Uh, I want to read a quote from uh, your book, uh, Emancipation Betrayed, uh, and tie it to what's happening right now. But before I get to that, just it's once I get a lot of inappropriate laughter. Uh, I've, I've heard frequently uh, people say, you know, black person's life isn't worth a quarter or whatever it is. Many times you were writing, you said, I am impelled by a force of circumstance to inform the Christians. This is a direct quote you start with from the Christian recorder in 1877. that says, I'm impelled by a force of circumstance to inform the Christians of this civilized country of a concerted 
an executed assassination of a colored preacher in the county of Hernando, Florida, a county wherein the life of a colored man is not worth two grains of corn since Reconstruction. <laughs> and I said again, that's inappropriate laughter, but I mean, dang, like you can get like yeah. a whole piece of corn for a quarter now. So I mean, woof, like yeah. that's man. But that was not the quote I wanted to read. The quote I wanted to read. This is Emancipation Betrayed. <clears throat> you write, uh, page, bottom of page 74, throughout most of the 1880s, African Americans served in separate militia units in larger towns such as Pensacola, Jacksonville, and Tallahassee. But the collapse of African American political power led to the demise of the state sanctioned black militia in Florida. In 1891, most African American militia companies were purged by the state, even as white militia companies grew exponentially. What a word! In uh, 1896, Jacksonville newspaper editor W.I. Lewis asked Senator Chandler to block the federal appropriation for state and naval militias because African Americans were excluded from state militias in the South. Lewis told Chandler that several southern states, including Florida, have laws on their statute books prohibiting the organization of Negro militia companies and making it illegal for a man or person of one eighth Negro blood. Now you're going to tell me you're ignorant? <laughs> Come on. Uh, one eighth Negro blood to have a gun in his or her house or to carry the same upon the highway. Lewis indignantly pointed out that the federal government was arming the white South at the expense of African Americans used to break strikes and enforce the dictates of Florida's employers. The state militia became Jim Crow's strong arm of authority. Militiamen frequently clashed with black Floridians during their annual encampments. During the 1904 encampment at St. Augustine, troops exchanged harsh words with African-American hack drivers and a fight broke out between them. Soon a riot erupted with the hackmen and their allies flinging stones at the militiamen who fixed their bayonets and called for reinforcements. Looting broke out in the city that evening. Likewise, James Weldon Johnson left Florida soon after he barely escaped a beating by white militiamen who mistakenly thought his female acquaintance was a white woman, Cowbell, ostensibly called on to preserve order the white militia often did the exact opposite. White Floridians went to great lengths, great lengths to enforce the monopoly of force that white militia fighters enjoyed. In 1896, a group of 20 black teenagers in Tallahassee began marching in formation and drilling after a military fashion using brooms to simulate firearms brooms. The Leon County Sheriff formed a posse and confronted the youngsters as they were allegedly going through their manual of arms. White riflemen fired into the group and killed one Negro boy about 15 or 16 years of age and seriously wounded another. A coroner's jury was formed and its verdict was that the deceased came to his death by a gunshot wound. Oh my God, there's Philip Trey's book again. Uh, at the hands of persons unknown. Black Floridians were outraged. M. M. Louis cried if the boys were committing any offense against law and order by practicing boyish parades on the streets of Tallahassee, every one of them could easily have been arrested and dealt with according to law. Louis voiced the angry refrain that swept over the South. Will the day ever come when white men in the South will cease their inhumanity to Negroes. What a great piece of writing. Uh, so much. Thank even, you. What I was going to say is you could say if you have anything to add to that section, but man, the white militia was about to kidnap the governor in Michigan. Isn't that what they just said? Yeah, exactly. They're still around. And I mean, the only thing I would add to that is, you know, when you finish a book, you know, the emancipation betrays no different 
Um, years later, I found out more information I wish I would have known back then. And one of them is that Matthew Louie, when I wrote this, I kind of knew this, but I didn't really understand it. You know, Matthew Louie was a Civil War combat veteran. He was a Union Army veteran. Uh, he was so severely wounded towards the end of, of the Civil War that he almost died of his wounds. And Matthew Louie actually commanded uh, what was then called a colored militia unit in Alachua County. That's the county I'm speaking to you from right now. And uh, because he commanded that unit, he had military experience. He taught the values of black armed self-defense. Uh, he was frequently targeted. The white people wanted to get him out of this part of Florida because he would teach people how to defend themselves. And, you know, I think when he wrote that, I mean, to me, it's just so poignant and so tragic what's, what's happening in the state. But as you're pointing out, it's still happening, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, in every sense of the word, probably word they've been using, embolden ever since. It's been the whole year of armed white people. Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse and across the country, armed white people. Uh, as I read through, you have illustrations in the text. And I was reading, and sometimes I'll look at the pictures if they're interesting, and sometimes, you know, just, ah, let's hurry up, just get through the text. And I was scrolling through and not thinking too much. I didn't know what you were going to have photos of. And I said, wait a minute, is that a black child in an alligator's mouth? And I stopped like, whoa, 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 let me look at the pictures here. And I was like, oh, man, we saw these before the gator bait photographs. Uh, we had some of our guests on before. But, again, always a great reminder, the quote was just, black life not worth a corn kernel uh why did you include the the photographs photographs of the the baby gator bait well one of the things i wanted to point out to people and i think it gets back to what you're saying earlier is that this is a global system those postcards are not designed for white floridians uh for their entertainment they're designed for white europeans for white northerners those are the main consumers of that kind of, of racist uh, advertising or you know racist memorabilia, whatever you want to call it. And and we saw it recently, and you probably have heard about this with the whole argument about the the chant Gator Bait uh, among the University of Florida football team. And when we took that out, or when I argued that it should be taken out, um, I had a lot. I got a lot of interesting phone calls and emails from people who told me that, you know, I was a, a carpet bagger, how dare I, you know, attack people's culture. And uh, it, it was it was interesting, but again, it's it's the reason to have that in there is to remind people that, that white supremacy is a multifaceted system, that it is about stealing land and labor. You know, it is about expropriation, but it's also about popular depiction. I wish I would have talked more even about you know, cultures of white supremacy and how the system, you know, say minstrelsy, for example, I didn't really talk about that. Um, you know, popular cinema. I think I mentioned Birth of a Nation only because black Floridians waged a number of campaigns to try to stop that film from being shown when it came out, right? Um, but culture is an area that I could have done more on, uh, should have done more on in, in that book. That movie gets me. That is amazing. Like that has got to be on the top 10 list of most important films ever. Uh, it's a hundred years and it gets mentioned all the time on this program. Uh, Gus the Renegade, the star of Birth of a Nation. Uh, amazing little film there. Uh, you have, yeah. oh, wait, Delectable Negro. I could forget. It's Gator Bait. That is Delectable Negro. Also in my top 10, Vincent Woodard human consumption and homoeroticism in U.S. slave culture. Florida would absolutely in fact he has the lynching of Claude Neal uh, in that book as a great example where they make Claude Neal consume his own penis on cannibalism uh, and then the gator bait. I have to look back in there but abs oh, delectable negro. It comes up so many different ways. The consumption of black bodies. Uh, the other photo you have a picture it looks like or it's, I'll just read the caption. Celebrating Emancipation Day at Horseshoe Plantation, Leon County, 
Uh, it's circa 1930s from the Florida State Archives, and it looks like a big. I thought, like, what am I looking at here? Is this like some? I didn't even know what I was looking at. Uh, but it's a group, large group. Looks like well over 50 black people, and they've got a pole. It looks like a black person is climbing the pole, and I don't know if there's a watermelon on top of this pole that looks like it's maybe 20 feet high. If there's a watermelon at the top, do you? Can you give us some more context to what's happening in this picture? Yeah, I don't remember seeing that on top, but it's definitely a maypole. And what the celebration is, and I was blessed to be just old enough to be able to interview people who participated. See, in Florida, Emancipation um, Day was generally recognized and celebrated on May 20th. That's the day that the Union Army liberated Tallahassee. And when I say liberated, the, the lead unit was the third United States Colored Troops. And people remember that event for generations. And so uh, Emancipation Day was when the whole community would, would come together in whatever town or, or village or city and commemorate um, uh, the survival of people uh, surviving slavery. Uh, and so you'd often have, if you if you can kind of imagine a commemoration where the survivors of slavery, you know, sit in the front row. They get to, to talk. They get to give testimony. Um, and then younger people have, you know, have poetry readings. There's games. It, it, it's not just talking about history, but it is talking about survival. But you're also trying to have a fun time. And so, you know, Maypole is one of those things that, you know, a lot of people from a lot of different cultures kind of um, uh, participate in. Now, I don't know what – now, you're thinking you saw – a watermelon at the top. Now, I, I wouldn't think so because it would be hard to balance something like that on top on top of a maypole. But um, you know, there would be feasting. Uh, there usually it's a two day celebration. Um, uh, white people don't like it. White authorities don't like it when black people celebrate emancipation in the Deep South because you know why should they be celebrating? Um, did they have it better during slavery? And you. You read this stuff that white, you know, white editors write. Uh, they don't want, and you you see an emancipation betrayed. Another thing I found was, whenever older black military veterans would wear their their Union Army uniforms, white people would get enraged. They didn't want to remember they had lost the Civil War, and so when even black celebrations could be times of great danger uh, if white people got involved. Absolutely, system of terrorism. And I think that comes up repeatedly. Uh, black veterans, for generations, black veterans are earning the ire of racist white supremacists. I uh, hear that for years and years. Uh, I did want to go back. You mentioned the Civil War, and we heard some uh, Civil War vernacular being invoked. Uh, you said when you did some of your uh, pushback and saying, hey, maybe we should not be using gator bait at the Florida football games and such. Uh, and you said some of the folks wrote in or messaged you and what have you, like, hey, man, carpetbagger, what are you doing meddling in our affairs? You know what you were talking about? I said, well, wait a minute now. Carpetbagger, that would be like, that's generally like a pejorative term for someone classified as white. Like, you didn't say that they, you know, said, hey, wet back, you know, what are you doing meddling in our affairs? What are you doing? That's yeah. like you said, carpetbagger. Right, so right. That's, that's significant, yes? It is. I, well, I think these people don't know me. And so they read something in the paper. And I mean, I, there was a lot of other choice terms used to uh, refer to me because I ended up, you know, I did an interview with the, with the ESPN affiliate. And um, at one point, people were, you can, I'm sure you can read the internet chatter, but um, at one point, people were blaming me. I mean, I'm fine with that. But I said, look, it was the essentially the decision of the university president of UF to end that chant. And, you know, here's why it shouldn't be a chant. And I think that a lot of people expose themselves as, you know, because some people are saying, oh, you're taking my culture away from me. And I'm like, well, if you're a football fan, what you should be concerned about is whether your team is going to beat the University of Georgia. That seems to be the biggest, you know, hurdle that this team can't seem to do. Georgia had won four or five games in a row. Now, having said that, there was a group of white students that still got together, 
and still uh, have used it. I haven't seen this, but but allegedly, it's some white conservative organization uh, who is still using the Gator Bait chant during the games. Um, I've had some students tell me that this is happening, but you know, because I don't go to the games, I don't know for sure if 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 it's happening. But um, it has been a great honor to be in your program. But it, it's it's uh, it, it's nine forty two over here. And so I need to kind of dial off, but um, it, it's been uh, is it it's possible, a great sis, program. You uh, came with, came a little late because of the meeting, uh, just to make sure we can check in, maybe get two quick questions from our listeners. Sure, yeah, yeah, okay. please. Let's see. Uh, evolutionists, I think that's it. Evolutionists for Justice, Evolutionists for Justice. Did you have a question for uh Professor Ortiz, you should be with us. Evolutionist for Justice, did you have I'll a question wait. or are you just listening? I'll wait. I'm still figuring, I'm still figuring out how to answer the, ask the question. Oh, okay. Well, let me get another person and then I'll come back to you so you can take a few seconds to, the, to ponder on it. Uh, retired, you. Yes, sir. Yep. Retired, retired firefighter, did you want to ask a question? Then I can come back to our other caller. Yes, sir. I have two quick questions. Uh, for Fighter, the guest, retired firefighter uh, in Florida. The, uh, so sorry. Make sure I get that in. Retired firefighter in Florida, right where you are. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, two quick questions for the guests. Uh, the first one is the recent thing I heard uh, that the about the uh, famous uh, or infamous Gator Bait uh, chant. Uh, you said you said you got hate mail for it. Yes. Okay. Uh, two questions. Uh, did anyone identify you as a nigger? No. Did anybody identify you as a nigger lover? Yes. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, second question, uh, you, uh, I'm quoting you based on your MLK speech, uh, and you said something towards honoring, uh, the victims of the, uh, Akoe massacre. Uh, how do you honor a victim? Well, you speak their name. That's one thing, because what happened, as you probably know, with the Ekoi massacre is that event was literally read out of the state's history. So I think you speak their name. Uh, you talk about uh, you work, try to work for reparations uh, in any way possible. Um, and you make sure that their stories are not forgotten and submerged and buried the way that they've been buried in the state of Florida for over a century. So um, th those are some of the ways, I think. Okay. Well, yeah, you uh, kind of hinted on what I was uh, going to go to on a, on a last standpoint, uh, 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 compensation. Uh, 1920 is not that long ago. Uh, I'm sure there are some survivors, some relatives. Uh, are there any receipts? And uh, have anybody, any white person, been recognized uh, as the as perpetrators? Uh, and and so, uh, are there receipts or, or any uh, people who are, are the descendants of the perpetrators who are sitting on or or have invested on the property that used to belong to these residents? Uh, have they been uh, uh, brought attention to? Have t have uh, powerful uh, uh, proceedings been waged against these uh, these white people, and has anyone been compensated for that tragedy? No one has been compensated a dime for that tragedy, but there's work being done now to try to figure out exactly who owned the land. Uh, who who are the black landowners who were uh, who had their land stolen by white realtors, white individuals? Now, Senator Randolph Bracey, 
uh, introduced a bill before the state legislature in this last session, which would provide compensation uh, similar to the Rosewood bill, which passed in 1994, which would provide compensation to the descendants uh, of the victims of those respective massacres. Um, the compensation part of the bill, I'm talking about the ECOE bill now, um, the compensation part of the bill was taken out by the state legislature. Uh, but Senator Bracey, my understanding is, and I was on a panel with him just a couple of weeks ago, he's going to bring back that issue for the, exactly the same reasons you're talking about. Um, the people that carried out that massacre, by the way, were very public. Um, the Orlando Sentinel reported about it. It was in the New York Times. It was in the Washington Post. Um, so it wasn't a secret what happened. Um, there was a cover-up in terms of the people who were engaged in the violence after to keep them out of, out of harm's way, you know, to keep them out of prison. Um, but, uh, yeah, there should be compensation. Much obliged, uh, retired firefighter. Uh, our, I think that's our female caller. Did you have a question for Dr. Ortiz? Yes, can I be heard? Your volume is a little low. If you could speak up, that would be helpful. Oh, can you hear me now? That's better? Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, okay cool. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my question is about that term Latino. <laughs> um, so... Are Latinos called Latinos in the country they're from? Professor Arthur? Generally, no, ma'am. Generally, generally not. You know, it's a very, you know, kind of North American term. What are they, what are they referred to as in their countries in Latin America? Well, it depends. I mean, if you are in, you know, there's all sorts of different terms of designation, for if you're in Mexico, for example, people often identify by the regions, the part, parts of Mexico that, that they're from. If they're Oaxacan, they often identify as Oaxacan. Um, increasingly, uh, there are movements to identify as, as Afro-Mexicano. Uh, but the term Latino is generally only used primarily by, you know, I'll say that in, it's generational too. I think I mentioned earlier that when I grew up, we started using the term Chicano. Now, Chicano is known in Mexico, but it's not often used. It was a term that really became popular in Southern California and Central California than when I was growing up in Washington State. But the term Latino is generally more of a kind of, again, kind of more of a North American uh, term. And my last question is... Um is, Chris, I think you said that your family's from Mexico. Do you know if there's racial classifications in Mexico? That's my last question. Thank you. Oh, yes. And I think, you know, I mentioned earlier the Spanish Empire. The Spanish Empire had racial classifications. You know, I, I talked in Emancipation Betrayed about, you know, I think you mentioned this, this law about one-eighth Negro descent. Well, the Spanish Empire had a system where it, could, it would designate people based upon how close they were to being African and how close they were to being indigenous or native. And it, you know, so yeah, those classifications were very much a part of the, the Spanish system and the Portuguese system um, of, of domination and imperialism uh, in the Americas. Much obliged. Uh, let's see. Evolutionist for justice. Did you get your question formulated? Yes, I do. Yep. Um, um, good evening, callers and listeners. Um, quick question. Uh, it's very personal. Do you have uh, a history of having um, promoted the ideal that uh, people of color, while subject to racism, should be encouraged to have sexual relationships with people classified as white? And do you believe in that and practice that? Uh, that people of color should have sexual relations with white people as, as promoting that? Oh, well, no, I mean, I, I, no, I generally don't get involved in that kind of, you know, that kind of discussion or that kind of debate. You know, there's a school of thought in American culture, as you know, that somehow interracial, you know, marriages. Yeah. 
I didn't ask about the discussion. Yes, sir. You agree to the context of white supremacy racism. So under those conditions, should more powerful people, white people, have sex with powerless people that are subject to their abuse? No, no, sir. No, I'm sorry. I actually misunderstood the original question. Yeah, no, definitely not. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we had one more person who dialed in. Can we bother you for a last caller? Oh, yes, please. Grant, let's see. The black African, uh, did you have a question for Dr. Ortiz? Yeah, um, Dr. Ortiz, you said you were in the military in South America. Is that correct? Yes, sir, in the mid-1980s. Did you kill non-white people? Well, I mean, sadly enough, um, I was in a special forces unit, and I grew up in a gun culture, and so I trained young people how how to shoot, how to kill. And so um, I uh, unfortunately engaged in that in that activity. Um, you know, this is one of the reasons why I often, when I start classes, you know, I'll talk about how colonized people end up getting involved in being soldiers of the empire, like I was. Uh, and so, yes, I mean, I was involved in the U.S.-sponsored civil wars in Central America. Uh, I served all across the region. Uh, and, you know, growing up in that culture at the time, uh, I was ignorant of what I was being asked to do. Uh, but since that time, um, I'm trying to, this is why I wrote the book after American Latinx history of the United States is to, to try to kind of get people to understand the U S is an imperial nation. And we, you know, we have choices to make. We don't have to be an imperial nation. And so, yeah, that that's, yeah. So, so to summarize, so not only did you kill non-white people, you also trained them to, to kill other non-white people? That's what we do all over the world, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Gus. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Much obliged. Uh, this, If I can just sneak in, this is my personal last question, then we will be out of here. I just I was reading your work articles and things and you have all this information, Dr. Henrietta Moore and everything uh, in your writing, your research. Have you found evidence in the Florida history that black males that they were attempting to establish some system of black male patriarchy, like when they were going out and fighting against racism and trying to vote? Did you see evidence of black males saying, hey, Laura Dixie? Get in that kitchen and get my big piece of chicken. You're not going to vote. Uh, voting and politics, that's that's menfolk business. You get in that, that kitchen and get my big piece of chicken. And in fact, all black females, we're not going to have any women's groups. This is for black males. Did you see any evidence of toxic black males uh, attempting to suppress black females interest in politics, voting or life in general? No, I didn't see that. And when you mentioned Laura Dixie, you know, if you uh, anyone who knew her know, knows that that would not it would never have happened. Um, you know, I knew her and her husband, Sam Dixie. They are both on the, the Civil Rights uh, Hall of Fame walk in Tallahassee. But it was always clear that Laura Dixie was the leader of the movement. And Sam Dixie uh, was in the background. He was the supportive husband. And. You know, if you know people like, uh, uh, and I've interviewed many people that, for example, who were students of Mayor McCloud Bethune's, uh, and they would tell you right up, right, right up front, Mrs. Bethune did not take back seat to anyone, and she taught the young African American women who were her students at Daytona Normal uh, Industrial School for Negro Girls, as it was called, you never take a back seat to any man, uh, and so. Um, I didn't see that. I've heard about that. But in my research, um, I, I didn't come across that. Much obliged. Uh, he has also written a lot about Laura Dixie as well. You can check. In fact, I'll post some of the articles so you can check it out. It's uh, from facingsouth.org. But much obliged. Thank you for your patience, uh, Professor 
Paul Ortiz hanging out with us evening. Learned a lot. Uh, take excellent. I guess stay safe with the whole COVID-19, COVID-19 situation in the schools. We'll check in. And I'm curious myself to see how that Thank plays you. out. But stay safe. Thanks for your time, sir. All right. Okay. You too. Thank you for the opportunity. Great talking with you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Context of white supremacy, the toxic black male still looking, still looking. Whoa. Uh, We will be here on Thursday for case. I was thinking on the one hand, like, man, we wouldn't have heard, wouldn't have had the program today if we hadn't been reading Case, right? At least I think at minimum it's good to get information out about Dr. Harry T. Moore, uh, Henrietta Moore, uh, victims of white terrorism on Christmas Day, religion of white supremacy in Florida. At minimum, it's always good to make sure people get a reminder. Many victims of white supremacy uh, have made sacrifices in trying to solve this problem. But I was thinking like, man, we wouldn't have had the program today if we hadn't been reading case. So, you know, that that does not really do anything. It's still a super lame book. And I appreciate at least he did have not super lame. I can be exact. It is the second worst book I've ever read. And the only reason it is not the worst book I've ever read is because Nutricide isn't even spelled correctly <laughs> like that is the only reason if Nutricide wasn't rife with editing errors and uh, what is it retired firefighters are part of it the African Liberation Army and all that other nonsense if uh, if at minimum they had a spell check at minimum they weren't calling Whitney Houston a nutritional Uncle Tom <sighs> Case would be in the running for war or it would be worst book ever period only reason it's not there um but i appreciate him having the integrity to be like man transcend race come on now come on now that is absurd to even be saying that like come on that is impossible i super like sound i might even have to sound clip that uh for case this we go along with the book study session because she references him in her book uh to say that like man and i say again read the acknowledgments like case is a book I despise. I'm with, I think it was Thomas in New York who said, oh, my God, when is this book going to be done? Can we finish? Can we finish? I, I'm with you, brother. <laughs> Black brother, I'm with you totally. I hate this book. That said, I read the acknowledgments. I read the dedication. I've been going through the footnotes. That's how we got our program for today. Like, I'm still going to read it all because I'm trying to learn uh, as much as possible. But, oh, that book is awful. In fact, he said by the naming right he said that specifically by making sure that we name dr harry t moore because that's what white people will do that's a part of racism that's in suntown towns they'll go and erase all of that that's exactly what isabel wilkerson does in case she talks about the incident of thabocephalosha but she doesn't name him she talks about the incident of both them john but she doesn't name him she names heather Hare white woman who dies in Charlottesville, but she can't even name these black toxic black males who probably hated black females and you know, all the way. Uh, it's lame. A second worst book ever for many, many reasons. But even with all that read, if you're going to read a book, try to immerse yourself and learn as much as possible. Cause could be lots of things, lots and like, I'm curious to see if the acknowledgements and all that will be included in the audio book of case as we get to uh, the end of the text. But that'll be Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific reading more important than watching television. We'll get to folks who dialed in, see if they have any thoughts. Uh, so important to get clarification. If anybody looked for folks who listened, uh, if you're able to take maybe 30 seconds or so to look at the faculty page, right, for our guest, Dr. Ortiz, uh, to see what you think if based on, okay, so you've been able to hear him for an hour or so, uh, our discussion or ask him some questions, uh, and then you can see, get a visual for what he looks like. Do you think he would be accepted as white? Would you, if you were around him, would you, I don't know, I would still suspect that this fellow could be a white person. Like, if you can take a second, maybe take a look, we'll see. I'll just say, wow, folks asked, listeners, 
uh, asked outstanding questions. Always great. Uh, I have, I would have to say at minimum, we got someone who could be racially ambiguous, right? At minimum, he said carpetbagger when they were fussing at him about, you know, what do you mean we're not going to do gator bait? What do you mean? University of Florida, that's, uh, that's North Florida. That's where Caller uh, at the courthouse, that's kind of his region of the Sunshine State. That's a little bit further away from retired firefighters, part of the plantation. But what do you mean we can't do gator bait at this? We've been doing this forever, you know? Gator chomp, uh, we do that all the time. Like, what do you mean? Messing about our culture, that's what he said. Messing with our culture. Delectable Negro, the, what's the full type? U.S. What is it? It's homo erotic, human consumption and homo eroticism in U.S. slave culture. Messing with our culture. That's what he said. Absolutely. The culture of white supremacy. But Dr. Ortiz didn't say that they called him a car or excuse me, a wetback. They didn't call him a nigger. Retired firefighters question. They didn't do that. They called him a carpetbagger, a nigger lover. I am still learning. I am ignorant about many things, but generally those are terms reserved for individuals classified as white who have gotten in trouble with another white person. There's a disagreement about how you are behaving, what you are doing as someone classified as white. That is my general understanding of those terms. Carpetbagger, nigger lover, you are in trouble with other white people, white person. Because they would just say, nigger lover, shut up, H back, uh, wet back, shut up. I get back over, go back to your country. He already said, that's the type of thing they would have said. Go back to your country. You know, what are you even talking about all this for? We don't need you over here. H2O back. They got lots of creative uh, slogans for it. That's not what they said. <sighs> Words are important. Can I be heard? Retired firefighter. Yes, sir. Yes. I, I'm, I, I was sure that you uh, would pick up on, why I presented my questions in such form, because primarily the term nigger lover is, is addressed to a white person as an insult. Uh, I suspect in my conscious lifetime that there are, there is great interest from white people as well as some non-white people to be quote unquote racially ambiguous. Uh, but, and I think he's one of them. Thomas, Thomas sent me two pictures of him. Uh, that is more of the, uh, portrait of the person looking right at the camera. And if you cut his hair, and take away the Fu Manchu mustache, you would not be able to tell him from a quote unquote white male. Uh, I, I would, I would be willing to bet one of my, uh, retirement checks. <laughs> well, they don't give those out anymore, but I think you know what I'm talking about. That, that, uh, when he was wearing that uniform, that military uniform, he, was identified as a white male when he was killing non-white people. He was identified as a white, definitely was identified as a white male, and he probably did, he may have uh, identified himself as a white male at the time. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Much obliged, retired firefighter. Uh, again, he has pictures, video, you know, online you can check out if you are with us live and you have a free moment or so take a gander 
or maybe look at a several of them, you know, because sometimes you might, the light might be different. As he said, it might be at a different angle, right, on the face or whatever. So look, you know, several of them. See what you think. Maybe you have a different uh, hairstyle. You won't have the long hair in one, maybe. Don't know, but see what you think uh, based on what we heard and the visual. Do you think this is someone that you would have suspicion? Like, hey, this person might be a racist suspect, or would you, nah, I think he's a non-white person. Keep it moving. He's a so-called ally in trying to solve this problem. Uh, let's see, Mo in Dallas, because you didn't get to ask a question at all. Did you have commentary, sir? Uh, yes, I yes I do. Thank you, guys. Uh, I did um, Google him. I did a quick Google search on um, Dr. Paul Ortiz, and, and um, uh, I just want to say he looks at, like one of my coworkers' husbands, and her husband has two first names. He looks like it be his. He looks like he could be his brother. Uh, um, he is a, he looks white to me um, like I said two first names um, when I did my Google search um, it, it identified his nationality as American uh, and um, and uh, when I read his uh, when I read into it he was he's a third generation American veteran um, so it is this his credentials and his studies and things like that but the internet identifies him as an American and he looks like a, 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 a white male to me. That's all I have. Thank you. Me, my line. Hmm. As an American, that's so vague. Like, what does that mean? Is he <laughs> talking about somebody who was born in Argentina? Talking about somebody who was born in Canada? Talking about somebody who was born in Mexico? I mean, <sighs> confusion uh, other folks uh, who dialed in do you have uh, commentary thoughts on you know if you got a visual and based on what you heard can I be heard yes ma'am um, he looks like a white person to me um, I think that mustache it's, it's it looks not white <laughs> but I think um, if he cuts it it would definitely look white but even with that mustache I would still be pretty suspicious of him. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is I think he sounds very knowledgeable and he sounds very evasive to me using that term Mexican, Latino, Hispanic, especially when he knows in those countries they have racial classifications. So yeah, he was coming across very, uh, yeah, very uh, deliberately uh, confusing. And I think um, he was trying to avoid being associated with whiteness. And um, that's, that's the commentary I have for now. Thank you. Now, uh, Let's see. This is uh, evolutionist for justice, trying to avoid being associated with whiteness, of certainly avoiding that classification of white. Absolutely. Uh, evolutionist for justice. Yes, sir. I think the fact that he did not first and foremost highlight or even give even a snippet about a transformation period when he said he was ignorant about killing and training other non-white people to kill more non-white people. He, he said in the 70s, we called ourselves Chicanos. Never with the why. But I've studied the word and the use of that word. It was people who were non white who were deliberately trying to separate themselves from what was called the Negro to get some type of economic recessions for an attempt at the illusion of inclusion. And many whites, where they come from, they function. They function as whites in Central America, South America, whatever those concepts are. He knows that because that's where he was. And he wouldn't have been allowed to train non-white people to kill more non-white people unless he was looked up to as. He knows that. And the fact that the, the mustache, the, the job, I believe he's a very, very, very dangerous racist suspect 
professional killer, murderer, who you would never suspect, the worst kind, who would sit in the room and do yoga with you all day and kill everybody in the room that's not white, if that's what he's told to do. By everybody thinking, that's our yellow or whatever, brother, based on the word he used. That's all I have. But I think he studied the show, and he's studying us. He didn't come on the show by accident. Racists aren't ignorant about the system of white supremacy. Thus far, no one thinks non-white person. I think everyone uh, thinks individual classified or at minimum suspected racist. Uh, they would be suspicious uh, if they were around them. Did we miss anybody? Anybody else with a hand up? Yeah, it was, um, yeah I thought he was white. Um that's why I asked the question about killing people. And then, like, at first when I, because I looked at the picture when you posted on Facebook, like, I Googled them, and I think right when he started, I wasn't, I, I'm going to say I thought he was white, but then, like, I, I was, I became more convinced when he started talking, and he went on, like, like a tangent, I guess, or a rant about all this other stuff, and you had to sort of, like, pause him and like get him to answer your question but yeah that that he was just like the other white people that come on here and talk for like five minutes without answering a question um so yeah i think he's just the white person very similar tendencies in the responses even the response it seems like i guess this might be one thing i have uh not emphasize, not emphasized enough. I think we spoke about this within the last week or so. Um, when we ask guests who is more confused about racism and pretty much everybody, especially white people, but everybody uh, says, oh, yeah, white people are, you know, with certain like with total certainty. Uh, as though, you know, you ask them, does the, the sun rise in the morning, <laughs> you know, type of thing um, to interrogate that? Because I have concluded that must be like a suit, one of the more important lies in the system of white supremacy in terms of white people being ignorant about racism, because even in response to that question, it deviated to black people being informed about who was in the Klan which may or may not be true. I'm not even, you know, disputing that. I think I've heard, you know, other reports where black people knew this person was in the Klan, that person in the Klan. But the question was about white people being ignorant about racism. And we're talking about black people knowing who's in the Klan. Like, that's generally when we have white people on. Oh, yeah, white people are super confused about racism. Black people are the experts that's in the same type of pattern uh did we miss anybody anybody anyone else have a hand up miss anyone i want to say something real quick he did something where i think he was asking about his race and he started talking about pronouns did you catch that guys talking about yep. like he and she and he refers to people okay yep 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 the conflation and <laughs> getting into all of it. and I mean racial classifications do not work in that way at all like I can come out and say call me you know Zong and because I mean they get out of control with those pronouns I can do all of that and that might be except where it will be accepted I'm especially in Se uh, Seattle I cannot just come out and say well my racial classification I'm going to say that I'm white today or whatever that is not how it works at all uh, and I'm sure he knows that system of racism like white people cannot be ignorant uh, about those classifications in this system the racially ambiguous folks that's fed back to back weeks uh, Dr. Uh, Patricia Sias last Monday same thing Hispanic and all that same thing like that'd be good to maybe listen you can just listen to like the first 10 minutes of both programs the response to are you classified as white? I think he at least did say no. Uh, for Dr. Sias last week, she did even more buckets of words, but I think he at least did give a direct no. 
I am not classified as white, but you know, I was sit- I'm with all the other folks. Super suspicious. He would at minimum be on the racist suspect list. Uh, any other comments that we get, everybody? Folks satisfied? I don't think we missed anyone. Uh, yes, I I, uh, I second the motion on the caller who mentioned about uh, the guest's potentiality to walk into a room and kill everybody in the room, and they wouldn't know they wouldn't know that he was a killer until he uh, uh, start doing the killing. <laughs> Uh, it sounds, you know, I, I didn't even, I didn't even know he was, uh, a hired killer until, uh, someone mentioned it in, in their question and answers. I guess I wasn't paying attention enough, but, uh, that's interesting. Very interesting. That gives a whole different light on the aspect of him not directly speaking to his racial classification. Cause I would say that that's something synonymous with someone who uh, is a professional killer? That they are, they by training uh, are not going to be concise, <laughs> you know, to uh, to anybody. Actually, especially a a person who would who may end up being their victim. Yeah, that's it. Much obliged, retired firefighter. He said, what did uh, M. Han D. C. racism, white supremacy means to kill non-white people? Uh, they, we've been on the air long enough. We've had a number of white guests and even some non-white guests who were trained killers like uh I guess that shouldn't be that big a surprise when a system of white supremacy, you have lots of killing. That is the business uh, on the planet. It just takes lots of different forms, but it just made me think like, yes, we've had a number of folks. I had to go back and pull out some of the archives. White people will train uh, white people and even some non-white people to do some killing. Might even train you to go around the world and train other folks on how to do some killing. Did we get everybody? Grant, soon folks are all satisfied. Uh, again, we should be here Thursday uh, for Cased uh, as we continue. That's interesting too. Like he immediately uh, recognized the illogic uh, with some of the content in Isabel Wilkerson's book, but he still raved about it. That that's what I said would be pretty common. Like I think most people would just read that book and. It's wonderful. It's going to save us. Oprah Winfrey was right. and Students are reading it. I love this. Like, I very rarely heard folks be like, wait a minute. Let me at least take a second thought about this text. Much less from someone who's a trained killer. They tend to be pretty precise. No nonsense uh, about things like, yeah, yeah. Anywho, uh, reading more important than watching television. Even with all of that, I still think uh, Dr. Harry T. Moore, Henrietta Moore, always grand to get information about them uh, included uh, in the program. They have been discussed uh, before, but certainly, certainly if you are residents in the state of Florida, I should know about those folks, uh, the work that they were uh, attempting to do uh, with that. Perhaps you can even go back and hear Dr. Marvin Dunn broadcast. That'd be cowbell, too. Uh, he is a black male victim of racism, but that is a cowbell. Uh, you can go back and hear uh, some of the visits where he was on the program. We talked about some of the similar issues, the history of white terrorism in the state of Florida. Uh, with that, I think we'll have our global Sunday talk this week as well. We can get international perspective on the election what has gone down the last few days, get updates on their Rona restrictions uh, also, but that should be Sunday, 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central, 12 noon Pacific. Much obliged for uh, everyone's participation and patience. We got started all late uh, with Dr. Ortiz. He said he was in uh, the meeting about the Rona and them trying to figure out what they're going to do at uh, the University of Florida and, you know, making the students go back to school early and all the rest of it. I have to see how all of that uh, 
unfolds. I hadn't even, yeah, I have to see all that unfolds. That is interesting. Other folks I know are dealing with that in uh, different areas of the country, the world also. But Global Talk this weekend, cased on Thursday, neutralizing workplace racism on Friday, and the compensatory call in Saturday. Uh, if you have an email, question, comments, until justice at gmail.com. Until justice at gmail.com. Hope it was worthy of your Monday evening. Uh, might be useful uh, for us to have uh, other folks because my thought process when I saw his picture, I can share our guest, uh, Dr. Ortiz. When I saw his picture, I was thinking, I think this is a white person. I saw the, the name. I think folks talked about the hair. He has longer hair. If you've seen his uh, photographs, longer hair. And then he's got the mustache and folks talked about. So I was like, I could see eh, eh, maybe, but I just think this is someone who would be classified as white. I think that was my thought process. And I said, we'll do the same thing with la I had even less doubt for last week with Dr. Sias, but this week that was my thought process. And so I said at minimum, uh, I think it would be someone who's racially ambiguous, which the term we are, which, which we already used, uh, and someone that I would be suspicious of. And everything about what we heard confirmed that. So that'll probably be the logic I use going forward. If it's someone I think is white, absolutely, they could be a guest. If it's someone who is racially ambiguous, would probably be good for us to ask them some questions uh, and have some dialogue, use logic there too. So white guests only. If it's someone that we're not sure, we think they could be a racist suspect that does count uh, so that yeah moving forward uh, and pff, even with what everybody said today we think we could have been still talking to a white person so yeah white guests only uh, much obliged uh, for folks who tuned in hope it was worthy of your Monday and we will be here at minimum on Thursday uh, sobriety would be best we did get the anecdote about white people throwing uh, loops of beer bottles and such uh, at he and the other black children sobriety would be best I think I've said for a number of years one of the worst combinations in the known universe white people alcohol those are the type of terroristic shenanigans you can expect in addition to being sober uh, election is over we survived uh, I would still say hunker down uh, it is still kind of rowdy. The Rona is still rolling, among many other things. Uh, but I would still encourage hunkering down. And if you got to go out, be super vigilant. Lots of armed white people. We did talk about white militias uh, during the broadcast today. Lots of that activity. Armed white folks all over. Uh, I would be alert if it looks like uh, anybody really is getting loud, rowdy. <laughs> this is done we're not having verbal altercations and things uh, with anybody out in public it is time to go get to a safe spot whatever this outing is it is done uh, we are all about risk aversion for 2020 that's it we are sober if you go out we're gonna be buckled and alert if you are driving you are not on the cell phone we do not have time to be texting and calling and all the rest uh, we gotta be mindful about what's happening around us it's been a dangerous year for a lot of reasons and we are trying to avoid contact with race soldiers trained white killers badge or no little things just you know not being on the cell phone being buckled up being sober much as we can control to avoid contact under very dangerous conditions. That said, Creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect in all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time replace white supremacy with justice immediately. No name calling. No name calling. Cow signing up. Thanks all for tuning in.